Marcel's giving those out for free, but I have one here for 10 bucks. Who would like it? <laughs> Just kidding, it's free. Do you speak Dutch? Okay, I don't. It's, it's for you there. It's 10 bucks. You can, pay, you can PayPal me. <laughs> oh, I didn't write it. Um, if you have a Bible, open with me to Exodus 24. Hymn writing has been a part of my life for 28 years, but four years ago, almost five now, by God's grace, we planted a church called the Trails Church in Texas. The first time we officially gathered was on September the 9th, 2018. It was an incredibly special day. Our core group had been planning and praying meeting and waiting for about nine months, and the day had finally arrived for us to covenant together a brand new church. We began the service with a call to worship, the same one that John Calvin used weekly in his Genevan order, Psalm 124.8, which says, anyone? Our help? It would be more beautiful in Dutch, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Could you all hear that? Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so with that, we were off to the races. Next, we sing hymns about the holiness of God and the blood of Christ that was shed for us. We read from Scripture and heard the word of God preached. We recited our church covenant and then shared the Lord's Supper together both for the first time as a new people. The first element, or the final element of our service was the benediction read from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, which has become very dear to us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And through that liturgy, through the words and acts of worship, we became a church. To say it differently, to use the language of this conference, we became a doxological community. The first time we see something like this in Scripture is tucked into the biblical story of the Exodus. The God who redeems had rescued his people from captivity, not just so they would be free, but so that they might worship him alone. Yet while Israel was still in chains, God met with Moses at the burning bush at Mount Sinai, where he would eventually take them, and promised there, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain, Exodus 3.12. Now, fast forward in the story of Exodus, the sacred assembly has gathered to worship the God who redeemed them from slavery, saved them through the baptism of the Red Sea, led them through the wilderness by his kindness and providence with the cloud of fire, and brought them to the mountain where Israel will serve or worship the Lord. They had been planning and praying and wondering and waiting for over 400 years. And the day had finally come for them to ratify, to make official the covenant that God had made with them. And through a liturgy, if you will, through words and acts of a worship service, Israel became a covenant people, or to say it differently, they became a doxological community. The scene portrayed in Exodus 24, 1 to 11, contains the order of worship for the first corporate worship service of the Israelites. Here we witness the sealing of the covenant between the Lord and his people as Israel is called to worship. They are read the word of God, symbolically cleansed with blood, and then feast in the presence of God himself. No wonder these verses have been described as some of the most astonishing verses in the Old Testament. Through the liturgy of Sinai, this 
doxological community has much to teach us even today about the worship of God as his people. Let me highlight what we learn under four headings. First, worship begins with God. Second, worship is shaped by the word. Third, worship requires sacrifice. And fourth, worship demands response. I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 to 11. Then God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The first truth we learn from this passage is that worship begins with God. Verses 1 and 2. Before we look at any of the other aspects of this liturgy, we must first realize it begins with God's invitation. God always has the first word. Worship begins with God inviting his people to know him in the ways that he has ordained. The first instructions we notice are some practical details on the division of the people, like seats that you would purchase to attend a Champions League final. I'm sure some of you may have been there. The people are not allowed just to sit anywhere they wish. They are assigned seats. The overwhelming majority of the people are, they're not near God, they're positioned way down at the foot of the mountain. In a stadium, the higher you get, the, number the, go, the higher the number goes. Like in the States, we have the 400 seats, that's where you have to look at the television to see what's... You should have just stayed home. <laughs> well, here, they're in the 400 section. They're, they're a part of the service. They're just far from the action. Halfway up the mountain, Moses' brother Aaron is mentioned, along with Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, who have later fame in the story of Scripture, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Now, these aren't sideline seats. They're much closer, like a box suite, uh, here we find 73 special guests, Aaron and his sons, who will be recognized as priests, are then set apart from the rest of the congregation to serve the Lord in a specific way. And there's the mention of the 70. We're not told more about their identity, but probably those who are given authority to help Moses make judgment cases back in Exodus 18, when it became more than he could manage. And then verse 2 explains, Moses alone... One man, Moses the mediator, would come up to the Lord. He wasn't at a seat at a safe distance. He wasn't halfway. He was on the pitch in the very presence of God. Well, all eyes are fixed at the summit of Sinai where fire and lightning and billowing smoke 
are the center of attention. So before we move on, let's just marvel for a moment. This whole worship service begins with God extending to his people a divine invitation. God welcomed Moses, come up. Come up to the Lord, the holy God whose glory is ablaze with fire, the one whose voice is like thunder over the waters, the one who has the power to toss the Egyptian armies beneath the weight of the sea, invites his people through the mediation of Moses, come up. So very practically, the reason that our service begins each Lord's Day with a call to worship is because we want God to have the first word. Corporate worship is not our idea, but something that we've been welcomed into because of Christ. And so I remind our church weekly, particularly for those who have a hard time being on time, surely that doesn't happen in your church, but for our people who are tardy, I tell them, if you miss the call to worship, you miss a lot. If you miss the call to worship, you miss a lot. Why is that? Because for us, we're reading usually from a psalm or for part of scripture that reminds us that God has the first word. God Almighty speaking, welcoming his people, come. The reason is it's not some casual thing that we've just decided to do on a Sunday. This is God welcoming us. Yet, not one of us, like we find here, not 73 but all of us who are in Christ, come. Come up to the Lord. When you think about the remarkable privilege of being welcomed by God into his very presence, we're reminded it's not because we were worthy enough or because we've earned access to him. We were welcomed because we were chosen. We were welcomed at God's bidding God has permitted us in his great grace to draw near to him. Do you worship from afar when God has welcomed you to draw near? I've been thinking about James chapter 4, verse 8 this year. I want to draw near to the Lord. I want to know him like I never have. Draw near to the Lord and I will draw near to you. And so I pray we would be a doxological people, a people of praise who find great joy in the miracle of being drawn near to the Lord and to lead our people to the understanding of what that means for those of us who have the privilege of pastoring churches to remind our churches regularly of the wide-armed invitation of Christ himself. Come, come unto me. So worship begins with God. The second truth we find is that worship is shaped by the word. Pulling from a few different verses of this passage, verses 3 and 4, and also verse 7. After they'd heard the very voice of God ringing in their ears as God heralded the Ten Commandments, Israel begged Moses, don't let God speak to us anymore. Instead, they asked if he would speak through Moses, who would then relay to the people what God had to say. Verses 3 and 4 show us the very rhythm of Moses doing exactly what they had asked only this time, when he passes through the word of God, they're not afraid. Instead, notice this wholehearted response. All that God said, we will do. And then Moses does the most remarkable thing. Dr. Hamilton got this earlier. He wrote down all the words and then read them aloud in the congregation. And here we find the first public reading of Scripture. Let me pause and just remind you that the words that Moses wrote down in the original language are the words that you hold today in your language, the Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. God wanted to preserve His Word for His people, and so He wrote it down. As you look further at verse 7, you'll hear a near echo of verses 3 and 4. Moses took the book of the covenant, which is found in Exodus 20 through 23, and he read it out loud. And it's important to recognize how the people 
treated, responded to, received the word of God. They're not irritated by God's instructions. They're not conflicted by God's commands. They're not perplexed by God's precepts. They welcomed God's words and reiterate all that the Lord has spoken we will do. We will be obedient. Notice in this ancient public worship service the importance of reading the word of God. Christians are a word-made people, and Scripture holds a central place in the life of our churches, in each of our ministries, and specifically in our lives, in our homes, and uniquely in our liturgy. Christian worship is built upon, shaped by, and saturated with the Word of God. Let me say this, it should be. Christian worship should be built upon, shaped by, and saturated with the Word of God. It's remarkable to me how people of the book read so little of it in their gatherings. So during the sermon, we read our services, as I said, begin with the public reading of Scripture. Our songs and prayers are, I pray, shot through with Scripture. Um, We practice expositional preaching where the preacher, me, I don't get up and just chase whatever passion I have that week, but systematically, intentionally preach through books of the Bible and And then the word is what sends us into the world each week when the benediction, the blessing of God is pronounced over his people that sends us back into the world having met with him. The revelation of God is the foundation of Christian worship. The revelation of God is the foundation of Christian worship and we see that as early as Sinai. I don't want that just to be true of our worship service but also of my life, of my family's life, of the life of our church, for there to be a rich culture of the gospel in our churches, a people threaded through with the word, and for the word to produce fruit in us, fruit like grace with one another, patience with each other, long-suffering with each other, and then also calling one another out of faithfulness to the scripture to walk in the way of Jesus, Obedience is not a bad word in the Christian life. Calling one another to pursue holiness, not just hearing the word, but doing the word as the Apostle James would call us to do. We know that Israel, this is quite quite a picture, isn't it? Because we know the rest of the story. We know these knuckleheads called Israel didn't get this right. Do you say knuckleheads? I don't know if there's a word that translates there, but hard-hearted, stubborn people. Here they are. All that you say, God, we will do. And we know before you turn the page, everything begins to unravel. But before we rush ahead in judgment, we, we see ourselves there, don't we? How many times have you opened God's word and closed it and said, Lord, all that you say, I'll do. And 10 minutes have passed and you've again broken God's law and command. And so let's commit anew, even now, to be a people who might echo this prayer, not perfectly, but to say, God, all that you've spoken, we will do. Let us be a people in submission to the word of God, standing firmly on the word of God, with it being the authority in our lives. Worship reflects the word. The third truth we discover is that worship requires sacrifice. The latter part of verse 4 through verse 6, and also verse 8. Show us worship requires sacrifice. From the beginning, we learn that mankind could not approach the holiness of God by their own holiness, or even by obedience to the law. The only way to approach God would be through sacrifice for sin. These verses are the centerpiece of this liturgy. The instructions for how to build an altar are given back in Exodus 20. And here we find Moses builds an altar to the Lord. There are two kinds of sacrifices mentioned there, burnt offerings and peace offerings. And here we see these two sacrifices mentioned again, burnt offerings where the entire animal is incarcerated as an act of worship to atone for sin, and peace offerings which are given out of thanksgiving to celebrate peace with God. We notice young men are assigned to prepare these animals to be killed, 
And Moses leads the way, leading the people in worship by taking half the blood and pouring it on the altar. The other half he symbolically pours on the people, probably not the million people down below, but the 70 elders representing all of the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you. The fact that blood is required is no small matter. There are some theological realities I want to make sure that we understand when it comes to the worship and our relationship with a holy God. I think there's four words. There may just be three. Uh, The first is substitution. Substitution. The lesson of the tenth plague, of course, was that redemption would come through blood. In Egypt, it was the blood of the firstborn son from every family or the blood of the spotless lamb. It was the blood of the firstborn son or a substitute, the blood of a lamb. For Israelite homes, the firstborn was spared because the lamb was sacrificed in their place. Their lives were covered by the blood and spared. And so in the worship of God, it's the blood of a spotless lamb or bull or dove that is put to death in place of the worshiper. The blood was also propitiation. Propitiation. Verse 11 presents this shocking reality about this group of people in the presence of the living God. Did you catch this? God did not lay his hand upon them. What does that mean? It means God didn't kill them. That may be the most remarkable thing here. God didn't kill them. Instead, there's peace with God because his righteous anger has been poured out on this sacrifice. His anger has been satisfied by this sacrifice being killed. And this blood is also a consecration. The sprinkling of the blood was symbolic of how God saw Israel in the making of this covenant, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Because of the blood of the covenant, the people of God have a substitute for their sin. The wrath of God is satisfied by the sacrifice of worship. And now they stand a consecrated, holy people, something they were not, but now made so by the sacrifice that was made on their behalf. And all of this is, it's good news for Israel, isn't it? This is why Exodus has been called the gospel of the Old Testament. Now, I'm certain in thinking through all these images of uh, sacrifice and substitution and propitiation and consecration on this ancient mountain, you've already gone in your mind forward to how Christ has been this for us. Reminded of another worship service that would come, not only that would include the flesh and blood of an animal, but one that remembers and proclaims the body and the blood of Christ. The liturgy of Sinai foreshadows a greater sacrifice that would come when the Son of God laid down his life as the perfect once and for all sacrifice for us so that we, a people whose hands are stained with sin, can approach a holy God through the sacrifice that Christ has made on our behalf. He died as a substitution in the place of ruined sinners. He died as our propitiation, satisfying the wrath of God against our sin. He died to consecrate us, to wash us clean, so that we might be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And so one of the things we do each week as a part of our service, we want to be a doxological people. And at the heart of that is, is coming clean before the Lord, isn't it? Not trying to posture or parade our righteousness. By coming clean, this is where we would have our confession of sin where weekly we gather together and just come clean before the Lord, recognizing that none of us is worthy to do what we're doing. And except for the blood of Christ that's been spilled, none of us have a hope. 
He died as our propitiation, satisfying the wrath of God. And we spend a moment just reminding us of these things. And then in the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What a gift that is. To be reminded of the power of the blood of Jesus, of the sacrifice that was required for sinful people to come before a holy God. The final truth we'll highlight for now is that worship demands response. You see this in verses 9 to 11 of this text. Before we look at these concluding verses, I want to call your attention to the fact that there's a, there's a rhythm of revelation and response throughout this passage, throughout this ancient liturgy. God calls, the people gather. God speaks, the people voice their obedience. God requires sacrifice, and one is made. And here in this final climactic act of response in this liturgy of Sinai, the people behold the glory of God and they feast in his presence. These are massive realities. First, let's look at the, them beholding God. There are multiple things to highlight about that comment. First, verse 10 says, with all certainty, they saw the God of Israel. Now the verb translated beheld is not the normal Hebrew word for just to see. It's a stronger, intense term, commonly used of prophetic visions. It's here used to underscore the uniqueness of this event. Uh, Now, 10 chapters from now, Moses will ask God, let me see your glory. And he'll be told, no one can see my glory and live. But notice it's not the face of God that they're able to see but it says his feet in my translation, yet not even his feet, but the ground under his feet. The holy ground where God, using anthropomorphic language where he stood, is described as a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. And they beheld the glory of God. And and then notice they feast in God's presence. And isn't this what God was after all along? To have his people feasting in his presence, to eat the covenant meal in the presence of God confirmed they were at peace with him. We're left to wonder what they ate and drank. Did they drink wine like we see at the Passover feast? Did they eat the fellowship offering as became the custom practice to celebrate peace between God and man? I tend to think so, but God decided not to disclose those details. What we see clearly is them beholding God and then fellowshipping, experiencing communion with him in his presence. It's a wonderful description of what I pray that your church experiences week by week when you gather for corporate worship to renew the covenant that God has made with us in Christ, to behold him to experience communion with him as you feast together in the presence of God. There's no ordinary Sunday when God's people gather for worship. No ordinary Sunday when they gather. Every Lord's Day, I gather with the people that I love, my family and my church family, and I have the remarkable privilege of witnessing a living miracle. It is a living miracle. A group of people who were once dead in sin, but now have been raised to life in Christ. And they congregate to worship the God who saves. None of them born worshipers of Jesus, but now through the power of the Holy Spirit, they've become worshipers of Christ. It's nothing short of remarkable. And in his great kindness, the worship-seeking God summons us, calls us, invites us to worship him. We begin our service by reading a passage of scripture where God invites the great and the small. He welcomes the young and the old. He receives the strong and the weak to gather in his presence and to enjoy him. In response to his gracious call, We give full-hearted adoration to God for who he is and how he's crowned us with steadfast love and mercy. We give thanks to the Lord for the great things that he's done throughout the history of redemption. 
and in our lives as his people. We confess our darkest sins, believing that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We're assured that at the right hand of the everlasting throne sits Christ the Lord, our great high priest whose precious blood allows us access in the veil torn through the work that he has performed on our part. We pray together, call upon God. We read scripture publicly, hear God's word exposed as it falls on our minds and our hearts. We're then seated, welcomed as guests, more than guests, sons and daughters of the king, right there at the Lord's table to drink and eat and remind one another of the salvation we've been given and then ringing throughout this entire worship service of communion with Christ, we sing, we sing, we sing songs of God's wisdom and ways, hymns of his salvation and grace, spiritual songs of our life in Christ. And within every threaded element woven into the service, we worship God. Why? Because we're a people of praise. We're a doxological community, and not just in the liturgy, but in our whole life together, being lived as a response to who God is and for all that he's done for us in Christ. Do we do that perfectly? The most theological way I could answer that question is a uh, nope. Nope. Does that word translate? No, we don't. But by God's grace... He leads us and he is with us. Isn't this the promise he gives us in the Great Commission, which we'll look at tomorrow, that he's with us every step of the way. So in the elements of the liturgy of Sinai, we we witness the sealing of the covenant between God and his people as Israel is called to worship. They read the word of God, symbolically cleansed by blood, and behold the glory of God as they feast in his presence. And as our churches seek to grow in our understanding of worship, and its centrality in our life together, I pray that we would remember these four things. Worship begins with God. Worship must be shaped by His Word. Worship requires sacrifice, and that sacrifice has been made only through Christ. And worship demands response, and in a Pauline sense, this means our lives being lived in response as an act of living worship. And even as our congregation think about together as a living worship, in response to who God is and all that he's done. And I pray by his grace we'd be growing to being a doxological community that would bring pleasure and joy to Christ as he looks on us and he's pleased with the work that he's called us to and the work he's doing in us. Let me pray for our churches even now as we ask the Lord for his help in these things. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you that you're the God of self-disclosure who has made himself known. Thank you that this invitation to come up to the Lord extends to us, to us today. And not only that, but you've made that so possible that you've come down condescending to meet us at the point of our great need in order that you would lift us We thank you for the person and work of Christ who is at the center of our lives as worshipers. And in your great grace, teach us the ways that we would respond to you in growing holiness, biblical faithfulness, as we live together as worshipers of the one who called us out of darkness and into marvelous light. ask all of this in his name the name of Jesus, the only name that saves, the name that is above all names. Amen.